Welcome to the General Electric ISMRM Land Symposium. My name is Yanis Panagiotelis. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer for Global MR and GE Healthcare. Our theme today is that it's a bold new world. COVID-19 had a devastating impact. In most hospitals, procedures, cancer screening dropped by nearly a half during 2020. As a consequence, the backlog of procedures increased, in particular in public sector hospitals, also by about 50%. Life expectancy has actually declined in most parts of the world in 2020, and the long-term impact is still unknown. At the same time, healthcare expenditure increased to record levels and is expected to increase further in the years to come. On top of that, we have been facing issues with our infrastructure. The average age of MRI system in the United States today has increased to 15.1 years, which is exceeding the average age of the car by three years. The impact in MRI procedures is estimated in 2020 to have been approximately 70 million less MRI examinations compared to the year before. Now, it bounced back in 2021 and is expected or estimated to increase to above 210 million worldwide in 2022. About half of these procedures are coming from Asia and it is also predicted that by 2025 there will be approximately 1 million MRI procedures for every working day. This obviously has an impact on the demand and uh, it is expected that the shipments of MRI systems will increase around the world. We have asked you, and we have been talking to you, thousands of you, about what do you need? What can we do? We hear a lot of answers, but there is one overwhelming theme. People need more access and high productivity to deal with the current critical situation when it comes to backlog, and the need for more MRI procedures. In other words, some degree of democratization of clinical excellence is what should be our strategy and what do you ask for? Do you ask from us? Now, GE is a company with uh, a big history. We have MRI systems installed in 121 countries. We do more than 70 million MRI examinations per year. We have shipped more than 24,000 magnets. And we also believe that we have a bright future. Last year, we have introduced Eric Ondiel. For those of you that do not know, Eric Ondiel, we believe, is the most successful, the most impactful innovation from GEMR in the last two decades. It is using deep learning technology to remove image noise and ringing by leveraging raw data, delivering sharper, clearer, accurate MR images without scan time extension. We actually believe that Eric Ondiel is fundamentally shifting the balance between image quality and scan time. The feedback from east to west, from top academics to community hospitals has been very positive, overwhelmingly positive. As Professor Holly Potter is saying, it's a total game changer. And let me explain to you a little bit about why that is the case. This is a real example from Shields Healthcare Group in the United States, showing three different sites and the impact that Eric Ondiel had in the installation of, uh, uh, in, in the MRI systems, in these three installations, over a period of several months. You can see that it has decreased or contributed to the decrease of patient table time up to seven minutes per patient, while increasing patient access up to an additional 29 patients per month per site. But it's not just productivity, it is also more accuracy. This is an article, and actually there is more than a dozen articles on Eric Ondiel that are already published in peer-reviewed journals. This article is in scientific reports from Nature. Dr. Lee from Asian Medical Center in South Korea is clearly demonstrating 
that there is a better delineation and, uh, of uh, uh, tumor uh, by using LECON-DL, by, by enabling the use of one millimeter slice thickness acquisitions versus, as you can see in the routine examinations, three millimeter acquisitions. I'm also very pleased to announce that uh, LECON-DL is now pending, 5TK pending, for uh, applications in 3D and propeller expanding the coverage of applications in a portfolio to more than 90%. By introducing Ericon DL in GE Healthcare, we took a big risk. We took a big risk because we went really big. We made it available for the totality of our install base, thousands of systems, for all our new systems in the MR portfolio, for premium users, and for entry-level users, for community hospitals. We made it available for 2D and for 3D. We made it available for Cartesian and non-Cartesian acquisitions. So overall, we see AirCodeDL supporting fleet standardization and efficiency, enabling democratization of clinical excellence, and it is, as I mentioned, available for all anatomies and all, almost all applications. And it has worked really well. The risk that we took paid off. There are now more than 2 million patients that have been examined around the world with Ericon DL. More than 800 installations, more than 1,600 customers have already purchased the solution. So when it comes to access and productivity, I believe that we are making good progress. But it is not just AI. We are also introducing a dozen of new innovations here at ISMRM that contribute and support access and productivity, democratization of clinical excellence. An example here is Osteo. Osteo is an application being used for bone imaging. It is visualizing cortical bone with inherent motion insensitivity. It's a one-stop shop for examinations without the need of additional imaging, for example, with a CT, particularly useful for pregnant or for pediatric cases. Another example that I would categorize in the field of access is prostate imaging. Prostate imaging at 1.5 Tesla without the use of endorectal coil, combining Ericon DL and air coils, it is now possible to do within 15 minutes an examination, 15 minutes an examination that can achieve or exceed pirate standards at 1.5 T and actually less than 10 minutes to do the same at 3 T. Another thing that we do, that we are doing, that we did actually to improve access is the introduction of Signa Prime. Signa Prime is a 1.5 Tesla system. If you can go please proceed to the next slide, yes. That has a new user interface and this user interface is intuitive, anticipatory, that uh, actually we believe that the technologies enables the technologies to uh, learn to use an MRI system within a few hours. It also has a possibility, it is providing ability for remote support in case customers or users need it. Yet another thing that we do to improve access is uh, uh, the ability, we're offering the ability to upgrade legacy 60 centimeter board systems effectively state-of-the-art 3T and 1.5 Tesla systems like Cigna Premier and Cigna Artist Evo. Access and productivity is something that we need to do now to address the crisis that we're going through today. It's very urgent and we're taking a lot of measures. But the future of medicine is actually around precision. It's around precision and personalization. So we're taking a lot of actions to improve uh, our performance in this area. For example, we're introducing motion-free brain, which is a motion correction technique for PET-MR. It corrects raw least mode data based on actual patient head movements. It is working really well, and my colleague Matthew is going to explain to you later, uh, give you some more details how it works but uh, with uh, availability of new uh, uh, agents for the treatment of Alzheimer, potentially uh, PETAMAR applications 
for, uh, to be used for patients that are not particularly cooperative, they will find a lot of applications. The motion-free brain delivers up to 60% improvement in uh, quantification and up to 1.5 uh, times improvement in volumetric accuracy. Last year, we have also introduced Cigna 7T. Uh, Cigna 7T is 510K cleared and uh, uh, it uses all the latest technology that we have available, all the latest hardware and software. In addition to that, it uses the Ultra G gradient, a really powerful gradient using holoconductor uh, water cool technology, 113 and 260 uh, uh, slew rate. And has just received a Recon DL clearance to also be used as 7 Tesla, as we said, for the totality of the portfolio. Moving into discovery, I want to mention to you that we are really committed in supporting neuroscience. At this point, we are very proud to say that we have the strongest gradient, to the best of my knowledge, at 7 centimeter bore, 3 Tesla, with Cigna Premier, the Super G gradient, 8200. We have the strongest gradient at 70, 6 centimeter bore, 113 at 260, and also probably the strongest gradient at 42 centimeter bore, Magnus, which is 200 at 600, 500 uh, slew rate. One example I want to show you here with Magnus is uh, sub-millimeter isotropic resolution diffusion, uh, B-value of 2000, really very high resolution imaging, not very typical for uh, uh, imaging diffusion. The last slide of my presentation has this chart. This chart shows the survivorship or the progress of cancer survivorship in the United States for different types of cancer between the 70s and recently. And as you can see, there are cases, like in the upper segment, where survivorship for prostate, for thyroid, has approached, is approaching 100%, five-year survivorship. While in the bottom part of the chart, you see that cases like pancreatic tumors, survivorship is below 10%. So what do we do? What is our vision? What is our strategy? We believe that by improving access and productivity, we can actually make the examinations for the types of cancer in the upper segment more comfortable, lower cost, and accessible to countries or regions that do not have access. But also, we need to improve precision and personalization. Precision and personalization in order to improve the survivorship in these very challenging areas at the bottom of the chart. The last thing I want to say today, I want to close as we started, with heroes. I wanted to pay tribute and some people, four people, that uh, colleagues of ours that are not with us anymore. Uh, Meg Foster, Jim Hudson, Bill Edelstein, and John Mallard have recently passed away. They were all members of the University of Aberdeen MR team that built a whole body MRI scanner in the late 70s and used it for the world's first clinical diagnostic body scan on the 28th of August, 1980. They were the inventors of spin warp imaging, which is still used in all commercial MRI systems today and probably in more than 95% of the clinical applications. With this, I would like to, uh, I'm very pleased and honored to welcome uh, Mario Padron, from uh, Clinico Centro in Madrid to talk about fast and furious accelerating MSK MRI with Eric Condiel and Osdeo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Johannes. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. In the next uh, 12 minutes, I will try to share with all of you my clinical experience using these uh, accelerating MSK MRI procedures. Uh, instead of Fast and Furious, probably could be the best title, Democratizing MRI. <laughs> but anyway, let's go ahead. Clinica Centro is a reference hospital in orthopedic surgery and sports medicine. We uh, perform uh, many uh, orthopedic uh, surgeries. We have a robotic surgery installation. We also have uh, wireless device for arthroscopy. 
there is a, a, a great experience using this high density autologous control site implantation that are performed and, uh, and prepared in the proper clinic. Also, regarding sports medicine, we are a FIFA, FIFA center of excellence. Uh, not so many all around the world, but we have uh, uh, this distinction that is very important for us. We have in, the, in our center, we have five MR scanners, uh, two 3.0 uh, Tesla and, and two, sorry, three 1.5 and two uh, three Tesla units. Uh, three of them, they have research case, and we collaborate uh, normally with uh, G Healthcare in the developing some pool sequences or just uh, some novelties that we can incorporate. Uh, the patients per year that normally we used to, to do is uh, we are 41,000 trauma and orthopedic emergencies. There are more than 13,000 surgeries, and in the last year, we performed 42,642 uh, MRI. Uh, examinations. Uh, we decided at the end of the pandemic to move all our systems to this technology using these uh, deep learning procedures that for us is very important because with the use of the air coils, we have one step ahead and we have improved very much our throughput of patients and the clinical impact in our surgeries and also in our patients has growing so fast and very important thing. So uh, we have two ways of, uh, of use the IRECON DL deep learning. One is uh, improving the spatial resolution and the other one is shortening the acquisition times. This is the key of the examination that we have uh, uh, caught with the, the clinical impact of this possibility. So if we go to shorten acquisition time, you see in the left side we have the conventional examination, 2.54 minutes is a coronal uh, view of the knee. And in the center, we can do a much more uh, resolution, but with unacceptable signal to noise. We shorten the, scanning, the, scan, the scan time, and if we move to the right and we apply this IRECON DL examination, we go with the same spatial resolution, the quality of the image is perfect, and we uh, lower the examination time. What means this, that we can go faster with our examination without sacrificing the quality of the image and the precision of the diagnosis of these lesions. We can do the other thing is we can improve the high spatial resolution but without sacrificing time. So what we do is in the left you see a conventional low resolution high signal to noise ratio examination of the C-spine. If we go ahead and we try to do a conventional high resolution, the signal to noise is very low. I mean, it's very noisy. And if we go to the right side, you see when we apply the Recon DL, we have a high resolution, high signal to noise ratio with a similar, and we lowering, of course, or maintaining the uh, exact same time, the same examination time, sorry. Uh, so what is the, the, I mean, the task for us is to diminish the, or decrease the examination time. We uh, using these protocols without sacrificing the, uh, I mean, with conventional resolution, fast examination or high resolution examination, with conventional acquisition time, we have decreased examination time in 47%. So all of our examinations are below the 10 minutes. So we can examine, examine one knee, one shoulder, one hip, one examination in less than 10 minutes without sacrifice in the quality of the image and maintaining the same signal to noise. Uh, some examples of uh, how can we improve the diagnostic confidence. You see in the top is a normal examination of the knee. There are some tiny lesions in the cartilage. We, of course, we appreciate very well in the conventional protocols is 13.45 minutes. That is an average time of examination in a knee. But if we go to the bottom, you can see when we apply the recon, we go to 7.27 minutes, and the lesions are seen more precisely. So we have lower examination time, better spe spatial resolution, and this was made with a 1.5 Tesla using these air coils and a recon DL. 
Uh, we can do, of course, farther on in uh, examination of the spine. We see this uh, spinal malformation with uh, some vessels that are in the epidural space in the, between L5 and S1. And we do normal uh, examination. I mean, this uh, sagittal T2 fast spinacostere, 2.14 minutes. And in the axial, we can see it down how is the, uh, I mean, the quality of the image without uh, uh, giving an extra time. In the right, we prefer to give a normal time, normal time of acquisition, but increasing the signal to noise ratio. So you see that the quality of the image is pretty perfect. So is, we combine, of course, with Fuset ADC map, and that was the intention. We want to have also a diffusion examination, and we applied with a normal examination time. So we don't sacrifice time, but we improve the special resolution using, of course, the air coil. So uh, another case is, uh, how do you see here, is in the left, there is uh, an osteochondral fracture, an osteochondral lesion. We did, the, I mean, the, the control three months later, and applying in the right side, you, you see that there is an IREC on DL with high resolution, and we see very much, uh, with very much more detail, the lesion, the residual lesion in the, in the chondral area. So, uh, and beyond what we have, we can do also deep learning in propeller. Propeller is our, our battle horse. I mean, it's a very extraordinary pulse sequence, but it's very sensitive to movement and to motion. So, what we did is we prepared some cases, and we say, okay, we're going to do routine coronal propeller with conventional reconstruction, like you see in the left side. In the center, we apply, and we see the conventional reconstruction against or versus the L propeller, and you see in the right side that we lower the time for 50%. The signal to noise is excellent. The quality of the image is a smooth, sharper image and perfect. If we go, of course, we can study another patient. In this case, it's an arthro MRI of the shoulder, and you see very well uh, when we decrease the time by 40% with the same resolution. Even more, you, we, we tested with different radiologists and all of them in, the, in our department, they conclude that the conspicuity of the lesion was higher using this uh, DL propeller. As you see in the right side, this uh, chondral lesion with, uh, with the orange uh, uh, arrow that you see in the below. And you then see it better in the other uh, examination. Finally, the osteo. That is the capability of uh, image the cortical bone with MR and the possibility of do also reconstruction. It's a 3D acquisition and is uh, very important because we are going to have lack of, uh, of movement and we can also do uh, uh, reconstructions in the different planes. We can also do volume rendering and it's very important to give to the surgeons uh, an, an overall uh, examination modality with all the characteristics of a joint, not only the soft tissues, but only the bones as well. So which is the clinical value that we add? Here you, uh, we, can, you see a normal examination with IREC on DL, 246 minutes, and you see in the, there is a subchondral fracture. And the subchondral fracture, you see it very nicely with the IREC on, with the IREC on DL in the right side and, and in the left side, oh, sorry, and in the left side we see as well this line of subchondral bone, that is a sclerotic bone, that means there is a fracture, and it's completely the same that we are looking in the normal IREC on the L. More, more, moreover, we are, can also see an insertional calcific tendinopathy in the insertion of the patellar tendon, not seen in the normal examination in the sagittal proton density fast spinnacle, you see in the, with the uh, orange uh, arrow. And here we can see also, we can measure how is the tunnel. The was, uh, patient was operated with a ligamentoplasty some time ago, and we can also use the, the osteo for do the measurements of the, of the tunnel. Another important thing that adds clinical value to this type of examination with osteo is the, uh, I mean, this hardware that we have in osteosynthesis, like in this case, there was a reduction of a fracture in the distal fibula, and you see that there is no, uh, we've saved time 
in the osteosynthesis, making with the osteo, but of course we have also a very good signal to noise. We don't have any, um, uh, I mean, any irregularities or any interferences. In the right side, we also see that very up the, compar the comparative uh, examination of the coronal uh, study of the ankle, you see this sub subchondral lesion, subchondral fracture, and in the right side, you see the coronal steel, 1.2 millimeter, and uh, with only adding 236 or 237 minutes, so it's no, no penalty in time. Also, in, when do the reformatted sagittal, we did in the other plane, and you see this uh, anterior apophysis of the calcaneus in the square uh, yellow, the fracture, and this practically the same that we see in the conventional MRI in comparative with the sagittal uh, osteo. This is another case of a very recent, uh, for the last week that we performed this, um, a marathon lady who was running and she uh, suffered from a stress fracture. We can compare the, uh, I mean, the appearance of the uh, lesion that there is uh, in the, uh, in the left, uh, in the left uh, iliac bone. You see very nicely uh, the fracture and we compare with the fracture that you see in the right side, in the bottom, you see the lesion, the fracture, the fracture line with the osteo. Also, there is another tiny fracture that you see here in the, uh, in the tuberosity, in this tuberosity that is very near the pubic rami. So, this is the adding, the clinical value that we have. If we study the shoulders, we have the same. We can see not only the fractures that we comparative with the CT that is in the in the right side between the coronal osteo in the middle, we see the line of the fracture. We can also see the, um, the I mean, the loose bodies that are inside the joint and we become in the comparative study is pretty good the same. And beyond what we have, if we apply these deep learning techniques to osteo or to zero T, we can have a very smooth and very sharp image in comparison with the CT. In the CT you have in the right side, in the center is the bone imaging with deep learning zero TE. Zero to this, we have performed some examinations and nearly we have uh, reached the 40 patients that uh, uh, we are studying to measure and to compare the measurements of the glenoid tract and also the hill satch interval. You have the glenoid tract in the left side. In if we compare the CT with the zero TE, there is no, uh, no difference in, uh, in, the, in the statistics and there is not significant difference. There is only one millimeter, the difference between doing the measures, the measurements with the CT and with the zero T. And in regarding the, the glenoid and the hill such interval, you see in the right side, what is the volume rendering of the zero T in comparison with the CT uh, volume rendering. And there is also only two millimeters of difference. So that means that there is no difference and we can go working with the same quality of working with the, uh, with the CT scan. So, excuse me for the one minute. Uh, the are technology, the, point, uh, the key points or the points to remember or take home points. Uh, remember that we have uh, with this technology a sharper cutting edge MR images. The lesion conspicuity, we have a great enhancement with all of them in all the clinical situations in, um, in MSK. The, we have a very great improvement in clinical outcome and productivity and this easier use of the protocols for patients of technologies give, give them much more comfort. And now the, a very important thing to consider is that there are no trade-offs adding uh, osteo to the clinical practice. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I would like to, I'm very grateful to my co-workers uh, Laura Carretero and Pablo Garcia Polo, that they are here. Also, Maggie Fung and Rob Peters for their support and help in the preparation of uh, this communication. So, thank you very much, Anis. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Padron. Next, I would like to welcome Professor Anders Dale, Vice Chair of Research, University of California, UCSD, San Diego. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so first, uh, some uh, disclosures. Uh, uh, and uh, so, yeah, so the, uh, I'm going to, in my presentation today, I'm going to talk about uh, some new technologies 
uh, uh, that are key to the success of some large multi-site longitudinal uh, imaging studies uh, that I'm involved with at UCSD. Uh, this includes um, uh, uh, something called the ABCD, or Adolescent Brain and Cognitive Development Study. It's about uh, 12,000 uh, subjects uh, recruited at age 9 or 10, followed for uh, 10 years and maybe more. Uh, and uh, that started about uh, 2014. Uh, they, we also have something called the Healthy Brain and uh, Child Development, which is about 7,500 subjects across uh, 28 sites uh, starting from birth, and that's about to be launched uh, this year. So it's about 20,000 subjects to be followed longitudinally. It represents about a billion dollars worth of you know, public funding in the U.S., and so it's by far the largest studies of their kind, and of course, that makes it even more important to make sure that this really yields kind of results that are useful not just to us, but really to the community uh, at, at, at large. Uh, and uh, so we worked uh, closely with uh, GE uh, on uh, kind of uh, uh, applying the kind of uh, improved image acquisition and reconstruction uh, methods, and I'll go over uh, some of that. Uh, so that includes the B0 distortion correction, something called PROGRESS, uh, now, now sold as PROGRESS by, uh, by GE. Uh, also real-time motion correction, uh, called uh, PROMO. And uh, the, of course the faster uh, acquisition and better image quality using Air Recon uh, DL technology that you've heard about. Uh, uh, kind of e equally important, I would argue, is kind of improved quantitative analysis and AI solutions. Really, once you have the optimized acquisitions, how do you now turn those into uh, meaningful and reproducible uh, uh, you know, uh, measures? Um, and uh, this includes, I'll uh, kind of very briefly touch on kind of the, some uh, technologies we've developed, again, in collaboration for uh, tissue microstructure quantification using diffusion MRI. Uh, uh, what we call a dynamic or covariate modulated multimodal atlas technology uh, and uh, automated segmentation and detection methods. And again, uh, I can't stress uh, enough, I think, the importance of product support for these advanced technologies. And I think this is an area where GE really has kind of taken a lead. Uh, so instead of just making the technologies available kind of for research, but in the, you know, the, the kind of the propeller head the, you know, sites, it really is kind of uh, getting the technologies into a form, it's FDA cleared, available for routine, uh, you know, use in large scale research studies, but ultimately for clinical translation into, you know, uh, routine clinical use. And I think that's really an area that uh, GE has, is now in front of the, other vendors in our experience. Uh, and um, so, again, kind of just going through kind of some examples of the technologies we're talking about. You know, uh, it's kind of somewhat, I think, underappreciated how bad the spatial distortions are in echoplanar imaging, especially 3T or 7T. You know, multiple centimeters of essentially spatial displacements you know, squishing or stretching of the images. So, you know, what you think is actually some part of, you know, the image is actually re truly in a totally different, uh, different location in reality. So, depending on how, you know, the details of how you acquire the images, you're going to get stretching or you're going to get compression. Either way, it's going to be er erroneous. Uh, so, we developed, again, with uh, GE, uh, kind of uh, what's, what's sold by GE as progress, which is basically just taking the forward and reverse facing code images and kind of a fast and kind of robust way to just get those images acquired and then, uh, you know, do the corrections, uh, you know, uh, and uh, so that's something that's available now, uh, both for EPI, yeah, so EPI acquisitions, uh, for GE, both uh, for, echo, you know, for, for diffusion imaging and for fMRI. Uh, now, kind of an even bigger issue for us uh, in, in especially scanning you know, kids, it's really, is motion during the scan. And uh, so, again, in collaboration with GE, we developed uh, something called prospective motion correction or PROMO, uh, using these kind of fast spiral navigators that we insert into the, essentially, pulse sequence in the dead time and uh, uh, 
uh, in the Empire Age or in the, uh, you know, the Fespin Echo uh, acquisitions. And uh, this allows us essentially with very little or no uh, time penalty, uh, kind of both estimate and correct for uh, motion in real time. Uh, and uh, this is basically the approach using, you know, so extended Kalman filter technically. And uh, the, here's an example of, this is about a little over 10 years ago now, uh, and we showed that in fact, by doing this, we could largely eliminate the, you know, the, the corruption of 3D, uh, you know, uh, T1 uh, images, uh, and, uh, you know, and, and, and essentially make it possible now to run automated kind of segmentation methods, and we did kind of both with and without, and so we could do a quantitative comparison, and we find that kind of on the scale of, of one to, of zero to four, the mean kind of, uh, this is radiology kind of assessment of the image quality or the amount of motion, uh, you know, the, the, the mean for the, uh, uh, with promo was 1.1, but without promo is about 2.52, and so a good number of the images that were without promo were not basically deemed diagnostically not usable, and very, very few with promo uh, uh, war. So, you know, so this is uh, uh, kind of, so for 3D structural MRI, I think this is an important and kind of valuable technology. But uh, so more recently, uh, we've been looking at applying this kind of approach, but using, w w taking advantage of the multi-band or hyper-band uh, uh, acquisition uh, for functional MRI. And this now, the key here is that you get many images at the same time. So each shot, echo planar imaging shot, gets you a whole stack of images. And that actually is enough. Every shot gives you all the information you need. It's kind of its own navigator, essentially. So it allows us to now estimate with about 80 millisecond temporal resolution or more than 10 hertz uh, kind of accuracy, if you will. Uh, and, and, and so we can largely eliminate the effect of motion in these kinds of acquisitions. And it's, it's quite important if you, especially if you're doing something like resting state kind of analysis where you're looking at correlations across space, they're completely swamped by actual correlations induced by motion. And so I think this technology, we, we don't have it quite yet kind of uh, in, in, in the product form, but uh, we are working closely with with GE to get it to where that's, that's the case. And I think that's gonna be a real game changer uh, in, 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 this, uh, in this space. <clears throat> so I also wanted to you know, uh, have, you know, have a few slides here on the, the improvements uh, from using uh, uh, HyperSense and Air Recon DL. And here, again, you know, that's the other challenge when you're doing pediatric imaging, the scan time. You know, the kids don't want to stay in the scanner that long. <laughs> so having a faster acquisition is really important. Uh, and uh, so here using the, you know, uh, the Air Recon DL 3D for the 3D T1 images, we can get essentially in half the time just about uh, equivalent, uh, you know, uh, image quality and, you know, uh, robust, uh, accurate uh, segmentations. This is from uh, I think uh, abstract uh, uh, that's uh, uh, with GE that's uh, presented at this conference. Um, and very hot off the press here is uh, now using this kind of uh, 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 Ericon DL uh, and hyperband uh, for, uh, uh, for, for diffusion uh, weighted imaging. Uh, and so on top you see on the left without area condial, on the right with, and you can see, of course, just the raw images. This is high B value, B equals 3,000, uh, just one particular, you know, uh, you know, uh, coronal slice, and you can kind of just visually see that, you know, the obviously less grainy, uh, better looking on the right, but maybe more importantly, if you look at the actual noise level, the mean squared error, background noise level. It's, it's cut by about a factor of four. With, with, and and that's, you know, that really translates into a quarter of the scan time, a quarter of the number of averages needed to reach the same 
kind of, uh, you know, accuracy. And that's obviously quite significant. Uh, and uh, this is just showing kind of a, I guess, more of a translation, if you will. Uh, this, this would be, so just 15, uh, you know, B values that be equals, uh, uh, you know, directions that be equals 2,000. And uh, it's, you know, uh, uh, the, this is about one minute worth of, uh, you know, uh, image acquisition. And, you know, with uh, Air Recon DL, we already have quite usable uh, data where you can have both the tensors, but also you can also estimate the, you know, the, the fourth order spherical harmonics, so you even get kind of crossing fibers information from it. Okay, so in the last few slides, um, uh, so kind of one, one of the, in terms of the post-processing kind of AI improvements, uh, the probing of tissue microstructure using kind of variable density or kind of multi-shell hardy uh, it's really kind of, a, I think, a, a frontier of a kind of where, where, where now with the kind of improved ac acquisition speeds and, uh, you know, performance, gradient performance of the scanners, we can now really uh, model the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, uh, we, we can start to decompose, if you will, the signal within each voxel into uh, different compartments uh, that are, and representing essentially the, the, the extracellular or hindered water fraction, the, in, the intracellular uh, uh, restricted, so both spherical or, and cylindrical. And so we can start to basically get quantitative, uh, you know, measures that are more directly related to the properties of the tissue that we're interested in. And this has got, you know, uh, some, some important applications to understanding kind of normal and abnormal brain development, but also for detection, early detection, and a more, more confident detection of, of, of uh, neoplasm cancer. <clears throat> and uh, finally, uh, so an area I'm quite excited about uh, now is really this kind of idea of uh, essentially modeling the brain shape and tissue properties as functions of sex, age, ancestry, and Genotype. So we can now start to create what we call kind of a multimodal dynamic atlas, and that we can use that now for improved accuracy and robustness of segmentation across the lifespan. So we can essentially build, you know, segmentation AI that can work from age zero to you know 100 plus, and it also allows us to kind of to to essentially. Uh, uh, create what we think of as kind of avatars or digital twins or kind of precision personalized norms so that you can compare essentially an individual to what you would expect for that person with everything you know about them. Uh, and, and that I think is really kind of the direction uh, we are going and this is kind of the fundamental technology behind kind of the NeuroQuant uh, product from the Cortex Labs. Uh, and. Uh, uh, I, I can tell you more about it, but <laughs> I think I'm running, running out of time here. And uh, just my last slide is just uh, to acknowledge the many people. I'm very grateful to our colleagues and uh, collaborators, uh, GE, and of course uh, uh, across the uh, consortia. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you, Anders. And the last speaker for today, my colleague, Dr. Spangler Bickel. Uh, Matthew, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction. I'll be speaking to you on uh, motion-free brain for the Cigna pet -MR. Patients move, but our images don't. PET, which is positron emission tomography, is a highly quantitative and highly sensitive modality, but it has a lower spatial resolution than MR. So on the right there is a PET brain image, um, and this is considered a good uh, PET image. It's obviously a lower resolution with, than MR, but it has um, those high uh, quantitative and, sens and sensitivity, which are significant advantages. The data that we use for PET images um, is acquired over several minutes. And uh, it's aggregated together into one image, and thus it's susceptible to motion. And that induces motion blurring in these images. 
In a recent study that we did, uh, published work with, uh, with University of Wisconsin in Madison and Stanford, um, we looked at 40 standard clinical cases, and um, in those cases we saw high motion in a third of them. And high motion to us indicates that there's uh, evident motion blurring in the images. And so motion is, is definitely a big problem in, in usual in standard clinical practice. And with the recent approval of the Biogen drug for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease, we uh, expect to have a larger number of neurodegenerative patients um, on the PET-MR scanner in particular. And though that's a patient po population that is particularly susceptible to motion. And therefore, we want to int introduce the motion-free brain for the Cigna PET-MR. You've just heard about PROMO, which is the uh, MR um, solution for motion correction in the head. And uh, this is the analog for the solution for, the, um, for, for PET data. It, is, it uses no external markers, no extra hardware. It's completely PET data driven. Uh, there's no extra scan time, no discarded data, and it's completely retrospective. Uh, it offers up to 60% improvement in quantitation accuracy. And the motion estimation that we get is, has a, one, less than one second temporal resolution and a less than one second spatial accuracy. It's compatible with all Cigna PetMR features like QClear, ZTE, MRAC, etc. So how does it work? Um, here's an example data set. We take the list mode PET data and we bin it into very short frames of about one second each. And he has an example of those uh, frames. And you can actually, if you watch, you can see the patient's head uh, bobbing as they move during the scan. If you can see it with your eyes, then an image registration algorithm can pick that up. So that's what we do. We do rigid image-based registration to detect that motion and give us a motion estimate. Um, motion estimation using image-based registration with such a high temporal resolution is completely new and innovative in PET. He has the motion estimates from this particular study, and you can see that it's quite a long study, and the patient moved quite a bit uh, during the study. Here are the three rotations and three translations. Another way to look at this that's maybe easier to visualize um, is if you take two points in the anterior and posterior of the brain and we move those according to this motion estimate, then you get a displacement of those points over time. So uh, that blue curve at the top is the displacement of the anterior portion of the brain over time and there's 10 millimeters of motion during the scan, which translates directly into mo uh, image blurring. That spike that you see there in the, in the middle, if we just zoom in there, there's actually a few data points there, and that actually corresponds to the frames that you're seeing at the top, so that nodding of the patient's head is actually that spike that you're seeing over there. Now, this motion estimate spans the entire PET acquisition, and so it covers all the MR um, sequences as well. Um, and so this motion estimation is available in a research setting for uh, any use for, for the MR as well. After estimating the motion, we then discard these short frames. We take those motion estimates and we do a full clinical list mode motion corrected reconstruction using all the data all at once. Here's an example of a non-motion corrected image. You can see some blurring in the anterior part of the brain. As soon as we switch on motion correction, you can see it crisps thing up, everything up very nicely. Um, the resolution is very good. There's no motion blurring evident anymore in the image. And it's the sort of image we expect to see uh, if, the, if the patient had not moved at all. If we look at those side by side, um, you can see those differences. And if we just do a synate through that, that image uh, throughout the brain, there's, there's obvious improvement everywhere. Um, another important feature of the motion correction is that it ensures alignment with the uh, MRAC, the attenuation map that is derived from the MR. Um, and this is a very important uh, correction in, in PET, and so it's important to have that spatial alignment and be, um, and be confident in it. Here, the, the PET is overlaid on top of an MR. On the left is the uncorrected image, and you can see where that arrow is pointing in the anterior part of the brain, there's some spillover um, outside, of the, outside of the brain from the MR image. Um, and that is not just a, a registration problem, that is actually a motion blurring of that PET image, and so the quantitation of that PET image is, is just not correct. On the right, after we do motion correction, the alignment is very good, there's no, no spillover, the quantitation is now uh, accurate. And so motion correction is crucial to take full benefit of um, both the PET and the MR, 
And of course, MR motion correction can be applied simultaneously using PROMO. Whatever the motion is, we can recover the images. At the bottom there is a, a high motion case where the patient really moved their head a lot. You can see some obvious blurring at the bottom, and that's corrected for very nicely on the right. And whether the motion is low, medium, or high, uh, the images on the right is what we, what we get, and they, the sorts of images you would see if the patient had not moved at all. It doesn't matter what the motion is. In a low motion case, um, the images with and without motion correction are almost identical, which is what we would expect without motion. And that indicates that we never do any harm. We only ever improve the images when there is motion. On the right, you can see some of those motion plots. And uh, in, the, in the middle, um, you can see if there's continuous motion. On the second last one, a step motion, or the last one, really erratic motion. It doesn't matter what the motion is, uh, we get good um, reconstructed images without any motion blurring. Looking at a couple of case studies, um, this is an FBB tracer, which is an amyloid tracer. And this is going to become more important um, going forward because of that recent approval for, uh, of that biogen drug for neurodegenerative diseases. So we expect to see more of these sorts of studies in the future on the PET-MR. Um, in this case, you can, these are the short frames we use for the motion estimation. And you can actually see the patient yawning a few times during the scan. Um, and that induced quite a lot of motion. At the bottom there, you can see up to 10 millimeters of motion. And if we look at the effect of the motion correction, it really um, makes everything much clearer, crisps everything up, the motion blurring is removed, um, making it much easier to read that, that exam. Um, here's another, another case of a patient who was talking during the scan, and this induced, they, they spoke almost continuously and, and um, induced quite a continuous motion over the scan. You can actually see their mouth moving there um, in these short frames. And if we switch on the motion correction, um, you can see how it uh, resolves the, the gyri very nicely. Um, the motion blur in this evidence without the correction is cleared up very nicely. Here's a case of a patient um, exhibiting quite a lot of motion during the scan, 40 to 50 millimeters of motion, which really is a lot, and it translates to a lot of blurring in the image. Um, and if you look at that, the image before and after motion correction is really a stark difference. Um, without motion correction, the uh, diagnostic value is really, really diminished, but afterwards it's a normal, it's the image we would expect to receive um, if the patient had not moved. And here's the last case. This patient was really seemed to not want to be in the scanner, um, and we're doing quite a lot of motion, and again, 40 to 50 millimeters of motion, which, which really is a lot. This is, you know, 30 degrees of rotations in, in, in some angles, um, but doesn't matter, whatever it is, we get a good image in the end that looks like what we would receive uh, if the patient had not moved at all. This case in particular is interesting because initially a, a sixth year trainee was reading this, so not inexperienced, but um, a more junior reader was reading this and did not pick up the motion blurring in the initial image um, and, and actually flagged the possible Alzheimer's um, indication. The uh, more senior radiologist then saw the motion, spoke to us about it, we corrected the image, and looking at the motion corrected image, they could um, say that the, there was, did not seem to be an indication for Alzheimer's. So this indicates that motion is, is prevalent and it may be uh, missed by, um, by less, experienced radio, less experienced readers, and, um, and it really can make a difference to diagnosis. Moving forward, we want to uh, continue our, our motion estimation techniques using estimation driven from image space. Um, this is a scan of ammonia over the, over the chest. These are one second frames, and you can see the respiratory motion there as the organs move up and down, um, of the liver and the, and, and the heart. Um, and if we zoom in further, these are 0.2 second frames of the same data, and you can actually now see the, the cardiac cycle itself. Uh, on the right there are just the rotating MIPS of the same frames. Now, this data, um, there's a lot of information here that could be pulled out, and, uh, and this is also simultaneous with the MR. So all of the information that is in here could be used for the, for the MR itself, whether that's gating or the motion vector fields themselves. Um, we feel like there's a lot of research potential here um, that we want to look at with our research partners um, and explore how this can influence both the PET and the MR. Thank you very much for your attention. I would like to thank uh, the speakers. Uh, thank you for your attention and uh, welcome you to a lunchbox. I believe you can find the tickets at the exit. 
Hay un joy a esa maram.